This meeting is being recorded. Okay. And, and so we can learn something from about the neutral stars. And here are some plots <laughs> that they look like basically every burst, everything that is bursting in, in the sky. So they have a fast rise and they reach a peak and then they decay. But one thing that you take away from this picture is that they don't look the same. Uh, I mean, different bursts from different sources or even from the same source can look very different. They can be short, as short as a few tens of seconds or as long as uh, hundreds of seconds. And they can be more or less regular in their peaks, or they can, for example, show multi-peaks, like uh, they can even have two or three peaks, very distinct peaks. And all these is related more to the nuclear uh, physics. And so the burst not only can help us understand something about the nuclear stars, in particular, so the exotic physics of the inside, but also of the normal nuclear physics. Um, and so basically the, more, the point of this talk is this, is to show you that, um, to try to convince you that if you can model uh, specifically the dynamics of the flame itself, of the burning, especially how it propagates, but in general of how flame burns, you can really understand a lot of all the physics that is involved in the stars. Um, again, to get um, kind of a picture, um, the, the basic modeling uh, basically comes from 1D models that assume the, burn, the surface is burning homogeneously. And well, here I'm depicting kind of the, a column across the neutron stars, while here it would be basically the, it's the temperature versus the, you can think of this as the depth uh, going down the star, or, uh, I mean, this is basically pressure, so density. So the idea is that um, matter comes in from the disk and as soon as it reaches the surface of the neutron star, it becomes to be compressed by the high density, by the high gravity of the star. And by being compressed, it, it's up a bit, and especially due to slight variation of temperature, it becomes burning. Because typically these nuclear reactions are very sensitive to temperature. But what happens is then when this burning is uh, near enough to the surface and the density is not too high, the temperature is not too high. When I'm, what I mean by temperature not too high, I mean we are still around 10 to the 8 Kelvin. Uh, the burning is slow enough that the energy release rate is, can be compensated by, uh, by conduction, by the different conduction mechanisms you have in, in the column. And so the burnings proceed slowly and you start changing the composition that doesn't really explode. But when you reach deep down enough in the, in the column, in, in the ocean basically, um, the density and the temperature are high enough that you reach the, the peak basically of the emission. And there, slight changes in the temperature lead to ex an extrema increase in the emission, in the energy release rate, while they don't lead to such an extreme uh, um, increase in, in conduction, basically, in the cooling mechanisms. And so the temperature increases a little bit, it burns even more, cooling cannot compensate, it escalates, and you, you get this chain. It's an unstable burning that burns basically most of the column and it explodes in the bright flash that we can see. And eventually, uh, after the burst subsides, the, the column cools and the reaction products, the, the, what we call the ashes, uh, can fall then down to the crust. So this is the, what, the, uh, what the picture is of the burst. And one thing, that I should point out is that it's really complicated because um, of 
course, the burning depends on the gravity because it depends on, on the pressure, which depends on the gravity of the star. But it depends a lot the different uh, tracks which you follow in this uh, in this diagram, if you want. The, the statuses that are crossed while sinking depends on the accretion rate. So in this sense, the use depends on, on, on the environment, on the disk, on the companion, if you want. But they also depend on the composition, and, and this especially for the different mechanism of the nuclear reaction rate. So that's why, um, yeah, for example, in this picture, you have this base uh, model, and you can see that you can get the higher lines or the lower lines changing either the M dot or changing the composition. And, and so that's why, for example, the burst, uh, observation of bursts are used in, in together with uh, Earth experiments of nuclear reaction rates and cross-section measurements uh, to obtain more um, uh, information about the, the cross-sections and so on of the nuclear disks. Uh, but to go more into what we can really learn from the bursts, uh, as I said, some of the results from the 1D models is that we depend on the local M dot, but also that we can learn something about the reaction rates and actually the reaction products, because um, a lot of the burst, if there, especially if there is some hydrogen left, you can have this rapid proton culture cap captures. Uh, so the RP processes, which are responsible for the production of heavy elements, and this can also inform, for example, um, the understanding of stellar evolution because similar reaction paths are involved there. But this is how we produce very heavy elements. And these elements sink down to the crust. And so they affect the crust properties. And for example, they affect the, the conductivity of the crust. And after an accretion event, the stars cool down. And and by seeing the, how the, the cooling of the neutron star uh, evolves, we can learn about properties of the crust. And so we are already starting to learn something about the physics of neutron stars. And this is influenced by the bursts because they, again, they produce these heavy elements. And another thing is the burst itself themselves are affected by the crust and the core because not only they exchange elements because the ashes sink to the crust, but they also exchange heat uh, with the crust and indirectly with the, with the core. And, and if there is, for example, a hot, uh, a high flux of heat from the crust, the burst, for example, can become more stable. And so you, you lose the bursts because the burning becomes stable. And some observation of the, for example, the frequencies of the bursts, of how often they are and when they disappear, they, they showed that, for example, you can't have uh, very fast cooling processes in, in the crust, which means something about the composition of the crust. And one thing that emerged, and it was seen also in other aspect of the phenomenology of the neutron stars, is that it turned out that um, there is some source of uh, heat in the crust. It's called shallow because it's in the higher layer of the crust, but it's below the bursts. And, and we don't know where this heat comes from. Because you expect far further uh, reactions or electron captures, for example, in the, in the crust. But these are usually called, um, th these, are, these are already accounted for. And, their contributions, for example, called deep crustal eating, the far for all neutral reactions that happen due to the compression in the crust. But these don't, uh, they cannot justify what we see in the observation. We really see both in the bursts and when we observe the cooling of neutron star, there is some, some extra source of eating. And this is a huge problem. I don't have the answer for this. You will not see it in, the, in this, this talk. It is a huge topic to try to understand what's this shallow, where this shallow eating comes from, because it's really related to processes in the crust. 
But some questions that would be addressed in this, in this uh, talk are, for example, how does the flame propagate and how the um, physical elements like the spin and the magnetic field of the, uh, of, the, of the stars, how do these affect the flame propagation and the observation of the bursts? And these are things that mostly affect the, the first part of the, um, of the bursts and what the rise time, because this, the, the rise time of the birth is basically linked to how the nuclear burning proceeds locally, so how quickly the temperature rises and how quickly this is propagated to the surface and to the observer, but also how when you ignite in a place, how long it takes to ignite all the stars. Because uh, we don't think that you can really ignite all the surface at once. So that would, would be coming from the 1D uh, modeling. Um, and that's probably the reason why there are also many discrepancies between the prediction of the 1D modeling and the observation. So the 1D modeling basically qualitatively explains basically everything. But when you start looking at the specific detail, there are many, many things that don't match. And those basically can be explained if you start accounting for multi effects and the dynamic. So again, a little video. <laughs> this is roughly the picture that we have here. We have the equator and this is the pole. And the idea is that the equator is the location where it's most likely to ignite especially if you are treating with disk directly reaching the star, because there you are um, depositing more matter and, and also the gravity there is a little bit different, so the conditions because of the rotation. And so the, there is most where it's most likely to ignite. But then from then, the flame has to propagate towards the pole. And that was a huge problem because one mechanism to, to bring the flame from the equator to the pole would be detonation. And that would justify these fast rises. But we can't detonate those explosions because we basically don't put uh, matter fast enough or we don't accumulate enough matter such that the explosion at the equator can really sustain a, a detonation through the whole surface. And so we have to rely on, on conduction. So a slow propagation, a, a slow um, yeah, propagation, but that propagation times are too slow to justify what we observe. So big question is how does the flame propagate? And what we think is the answer is this. So here in this, um, you see a 3D simulation and look at the scales because horizontally is kilometers while vertical is only a few meters. So what you see here, it's something which is really stretched horizontally. And outside you see the color of the temperature and inside that red line is the nuclear burning, is where the burning is proceeding. Basically that's your real flame. And so the idea that we have is that you ignite at the equator and then there's something which is confining your flame and allowing it to propagate but fast enough. And to see this a little bit more in detail, it's, it's this. Again, this the color is temperature and again, equator on one side and pole on the other. And this is what we think that, that's happening. And the dots are tracer particles. The idea is that you ignite at the equator and the heat just makes the fuel expand. But if the fuel expands freely, it would go on top of the surface and spill freely across the surface. And then you would dissipate that heat very quickly and kill the flame. So you could not have bursts. What turns out is that while the, the fuel expands towards the, I mean, to higher radii and tries to move towards the equator, the Coriolis force kicks in, and I have here a picture. While the fuel is trying to move towards the pole, the Coriolis force turns it into the east-west uh, direction and creates a structure which is called thermal wind, again from geophysics. 
and here is the velocity coming out of the plane and this is the coming out of the plane is east-west direction and by diverting this um, the fuel in this direction it confines the flame it confines the hot fuel and by confining the hot fuel you create this structure that you see uh, self-replicating while the flame is propagating and basically it keeps the hot uh, fuel there without allowing it to expand to a, to a surface which would be too too wide and so it keeps the heat and it allows the flame to survive but at the same time it, it forms this interface which you, again it's self-replicating all along the propagation between the hot and the cold fuel and this very extended surface because again horizontally we're talking about kilometers and vertically it's just a few meters so it's very stretched horizontally this along this interface you have mixing which you can see if you try to follow the the tracer particles you start mixing uh particles that come from a head which are cold but rich in burnable fuel and you bring them to the flame and at the same time you bring hot fuel which has already been burning but is hot and so it goes ahead by basically a kilometer or so and that fuel begins to heat up the cold fuel so basically you have conduction working along this this interface but it's not a vertical interface if it was vertical the speed of um, of conduction would be very very slow by being horizontally stretched you have basically a huge geometrical factor that makes basically your conduction having more surface over which to work and so it allows the flame to propagate way fast so that was great because okay we could get a flame that survives thanks to the Coriolis force confinement that propagates through conduction which is good because we cannot detonate and again thanks to the confinement which is not too much thanks to the Coriolis force it helps conduction and so it's relatively fast but one problem from this simulation is that the velocity you get from this uh, clean let's call them like that simulations is that the uh, the propagation is still a little bit too slow to explain the, the observations. And there you can start thinking about other ingredients. And one of these ingredients is magnetic fields. So when we added magnetic fields, uh, and in this case you see kind of a vertical magnetic field, what happens is that the magnetic field is spreading the fuel but it acts a little bit like uh, rubber bands, like elastics. So by the interaction between this wind that I showed you before, that is trying to move the fuel uh, and, and so is trying to bend in the magnetic field, uh, the magnetic field tension kicks back and so it, oppos it opposes the, the wind decreasing basically the con confinement uh, and making it even longer so this helps stretching the surface where conduction can work and this makes um, propagation even faster but even better than that you create instabilities and the instabilities which basically here are interchange instabilities they tap on the gravity of the star which is huge so there's a lot of energy which turns into basically mechanical mixing. And so you can really take hot fuel and move it ahead way faster. And this fuel can on its own, again, start eating up the fuel ahead and support a faster propagation of the flame. So this was great because here we put um, fields of the order 10 to 7, 10 to the 8 Gauss which are the fuel, the fields that we expect in some of the systems. And in these cases, the velocities that we were obtaining for the flame matched perfectly what we would see in observation. So we were very happy. But some question remains is for other systems where we didn't see such strong magnetic fields. Now, magnetic fields are mostly detected by this fact 
that we see this accretion pulsations, as I, should, I told you in the beginning. So if the magnetic field is really aligned with the rotational axis, you wouldn't see that and you wouldn't be inferring a strong magnetic field. So it could be that they, are, they still have strong magnetic fields, but we don't see them. And then this simulation would still explain the observation. Or it could be that they have weaker magnetic fields. And then the question is, what happened in this case? But the answer comes again from uh, hydrodynamic itself. And it's this. And the thing is, I showed you that, that uh, structure of the wind. And if you saw, there were many colors, which meant there's a lot of shear vertically in those layers. And that's uh, a recipe for instability. This thing is also observed on Earth, and it's called baroclinic instability. And basically, what, what it means is that that interface that we saw in the pure hydro simulation, it's clean if you do it numerically, but in reality, the sooner you perturb it infinitesimally, it explodes. And again, it's stopping on the gravity. This is basically a relay Taylor instability, similar to the relay Taylor instability. And so it's stopping on gravity, so it's a lot of energy, and it generates again this strong mechanical mixing that you can see in the movie. And basically, what happens is that um, as soon as you perturb the flame, you see the flame becomes, starts vorticing in this way, and then that breaks down into further vortices and you form various vortices across the surface of the star. And to see it a little bit better, it's, it's, it's like this. Um, this again is, this is seen from the top, again, the equator and the pole. And this is the composition. So red means very burnable, which means cold, and blue means already burnt, um, so ashes, if you want. And this is, is basically the, the line of the interface. And as soon as you perturb it, it starts mixing. And if you look a little bit of this shape, it, it reminds the mushroom cloud, if you want. So the, the really the Rayleigh Taylor, because it's the same mechanism. is heavy fuel, which is the cold one, on top of the uh, light one, which would be the cold one, the hot one, the one that has been burning. And it works diagonally thanks to this interface, which is this wind, this shear wind. And it works diagonally both in the vertical direction and horizontally. And it starts mixing stuff like that. So it launches fuel ahead, which again will bring heat and so starting heating up fuel ahead. And it brings fuel that can burn back into the flame. And at later stages, this mixing launches material that will be again confined by Coriolis force. And this helps that blob basically surviving as, an, as a burning fuel instead of dissipating its heat too quickly. And that again becomes unstable. It breaks down in far for vortices and it launches other vortices ahead. And this basically propagates until the pole making this mixing and this heating up out of the flame um, way faster because you're mechanically moving the heat. And, uh, and so, again, only with pure hydro, we can get the same kind of velocity and therefore explain um, the fast rises in bursts uh, that we observe, even if we don't have a magnetic field. In case of magnetic fields, these vortices could form or not. I mean, that's still a work in progress. But again, we saw that magnetic fields already generate their own kind of instabilities. So, um, I mean, we have an explanation of the fast propagation in both cases. Some details, and I'm going to talk a little bit about this later. But so, some answer to the questions how does the flame propagate? Through conduction, luckily, because that's the only real instrument that we have. But we can have a fast conduction thanks to the mixing with the instabilities. And this we can have thanks to spin and Coriolis force that allows the flame to survive, but also allows to the instabilities. And also the magnetic field 
first role is this, it also leads to instability. So, so it seems like we have some kind of a handle, some a few details are still work in progress, but it, it, it seems like we finally can justify and understand what we see in the beginning of the bursts. And this is very important because what happens in the beginning can help us understand what happens at the end of the bursts. And that's perhaps what becomes a little bit more interesting when it comes to understanding the properties of the neutron stars. So, what, uh, okay, this decaying part, as I said, is when the flame has already basically covered the, the neutron stars and, and now the fuel is coming down. Now, what's very interesting about the tail of bursts is what's called burst oscillations that uh, they are basically fluctuations of the light curves, quasi-periodic in the sense that some of them um, change their frequency while the burst is evolving. Some of them, in some sources, they are constant at the same frequency, but some change. And they are actually detected all along the bursts, but mostly along the tail. And the way you detect them is not by high. I mean, this light curve is very um, noisy, very regular, but that's just um, photon counting noise. You see really the oscillations if you do basically Fourier transforms of bits of the light curve. Not necessarily just here where I show it, but along all the light curves. You take a little bit of a, a chunk of the data and you do a transform. Because if you take a big uh, chunk, then the variation in intensity is influencing your frequency in the Fourier transform. But if the chunks are small enough, you can really see that there are strong signals um, in the light curve. And this was detected initially in 1996, even by SMI. And the frequencies are very high, around 300 hertz, 400 hertz, and basically already Stromayer in their, at all in their detection paper, they said the most uh, plausible explanation is that somehow this, um, these oscillations are related to the spin of the star. And they indeed suggested that we are seeing the spin frequency of the star. The idea is in general that you have some pattern like you have in pulsars that is rotating again, it's a lighthouse, and then when it comes into view, it's brighter, it oscillates a little bit higher, and when it goes out of view, it goes down in intensity. And why is that so interesting? It's because of this. Um, so this is a movie made by Tom Riley, and the idea is that if you have some sort of uh, surface, pattern, surface pattern on the neutron star, as I mentioned at the beginning, the, the light as it leaves the surface is really affected by the gravity of the star. So what you see here would be the um, total countering, the volumetric light curves, and here is the, the light curves in different frequencies. And the thing is that here the GR effects become important. So, for example, since you see a little bit of behind the star, the, the amplitude of the oscillation is a little bit smaller because you keep seeing light even a little bit behind the star. And for example, the fact that the equator is spinning faster than the pole means that you have more beaming at the equator, means that you have more redshift due to the rotation, to the speed by the light that is emitted at the equator than what comes from the pole. And so basically, if you do measure, if you're able to measure the pulse shapes of the burst oscillations um, well enough and at different frequencies, and you start accounting for the accounting for the effects of the general relativity and of course the special relativity, basically, you can reconstruct at least the compactness, so the mass of the ratio of mass over radius of the neutron. And if you have already a measurement of the mass through your ephemerides, for example, of the binary, then you can also measure the radius. And as I told you at the beginning, radius is really something which is discriminating between the different uh, 
physical models for what's going on in the theory of the neutron stars. And a similar method has been applied, for example, to uh, the accretion power pulsars, which can also apply to um, to the to the burst oscillations. No? And one lesson that has been learned by applying this to, to pulsars is that, uh, I mean, a satellite with NICER was especially built basically for this. It's a, it's a, it's a telescope, it's an X-ray telescope, is the neutron star interior composition no? explorer. It's on the, um, it's on the Alpha station and its goal uh, was to measure uh, accretion power um, pulsars and then also burst, bursting uh, Newton stars to measure the, the pulsation and from this reconstruct doing this reversing engineer on the pulse phases to, reckon, to learn about the mass and radii and so to learn about the, the internal composition of the star. But one of the big problems is that this process needs information about the emission pattern because of course different emission pattern can give you some kind of the, um, the same pulses if you mix them with slightly different neutron stars and, and so there's some kind of degeneracy or at least you have to fit for the emission pattern uh, you, some parameters of the emission pattern which means the error that you get on your measurements are larger and so it becomes more difficult to distinguish between one theory or the other. So knowing the pattern becomes impo important and initially it was thought that the accretion uh, power were just the magnetic poles uh, generating the pulsation so they, they were supposed to be easy to hotspot turns out that those patterns are not that easy, are not that simple. And so this problem of the pattern, it, it becomes relevant. And with bursts, it's basically the same. The idea is what's causing this, these oscillations. One idea is again, that there is some kind of a hotspot. And, and if you think about the early stages of the bursts, you can have the ignition site but again, it forms kind of an hurricane confined by the nuclear force, especially if this is not at the equator, it's a little bit higher. And this can um, cause, for example, pulsation in the rise time, during the rise time. Or you can have a similar thing if you have magnetic accretion, and again, you can expect that the uh, ignition is closer to the magnetic poles, because again, that's where you're dumping most of your matter. Um, that's still to be fully justified, but you can have an effect of the magnetic field on the, on the fuel. And so that could generate some kind of pattern again, especially perhaps during the early stages, but that again is to be checked. And, and I'm going quickly to the conclusions, but for example, especially in the tails, perhaps the best explanation is that once the flame has propagated, it has excited waves in this ocean and because it's not an homogeneous uh, flow. And, and where the, the wave is basically compressing a little bit the fuel, the fuel becomes brighter. And so you have a bright patch like in this picture. And when the fuel is a little bit less compressed, uh, you have a, a dimmer patch. But which modes exactly are excited and where and how strong they are, it really affects uh, how strong your signal is. And again, there have been some initial uh, calculations, but there are some disagreement with the observations. So again, I don't have the answer, but some work that's going towards explaining, especially these waves, could be related to what we see in the propagation, in the sense that we have seen that um, we form this, this, um, this basically this hotter patches, these localized uh, vortices that they have also broke down. No? And so this 
start being start existing during the propagation and they last also while the the whole surface is cooling down so they can have an influence on the patterns that we see and what we've learned from this simulation is that uh, what causes the pattern well it's really important where you are igniting because if you ignite at the equator initially you have a ring so if you're forming patterns they form above and they could be determined by this launching of vortices due to the instabilities and for example it's a little bit less likely the first picture that i showed you this one where you have a huge uh, single hot spot at the beginning that is expanding only to engulf the star because that big hurricane of fire would basically sorry was this that would basically break down into smaller vortices. And, and so it would become a less strong uh, disomogeneity and so a less strong uh, signal in the burst oscillation that we see in the rises. But the location of these vertices, especially in the tail, they could explain um, which modes are excited. Because these vortices basically locate themselves in, in function of the, the app, their size is determined by the spin frequency, because again, it's Coriolis force. And so the faster spinning, the more small they are. Um, and so their location across the latitudes could uh, determine which modes are excited, because there is where there is more burning, this can feed the epsilon pumping, which is um, the energy release uh, also depends on compression. So you compress more, you generate more, more energy. And so that burns more and it dilates. So it burns less. And this mechanism basically starts exciting oscillation. So where you form this vortices can fix basically which pattern you're forming. And this can affect, this can also depend on where ignition started. And this can affect what you see. But once again, how these vortices interact, or in general, how the instabilities are affected by the presence of magnetic field, that could that's still really work in progress, and it could change things. Indeed, the burst oscillation of the sources that have strong magnetic field, they behave differently. They tend to be stuck at a specific frequency. And really, to tell you the last thing, so I hope I'm roughly in time, um we have kind of recently um studied again the, the the burst from a specific source that has a strong magnetic field and with alessandro patun what we what basically he noticed the, in the data is that uh here you have a burst and we if you divide the burst in chunks and you measure the burst oscillation you see that the arrival time of the crest of the oscillation, it's basically related to the burst intensity. And we have a reference from the phase, from the arrival time of this uh, lighthouse, because this is also an accretion power pulsation. It has a strong magnetic field. It has these patch patches that are strong. And systematically, if we checked all the bursts and we sort of stuck them together, which is a bit difficult because they are not the same size and duration, but basically it's statistical, statistically significant that at the peak of the burst, the, the top of the wave reaches you later than the average one. And as the burst subsides, it reaches afterwards, but roughly always with the same frequency, which is the speed. So our conclusion from this, and this is really a toy model, we have no simulations. We, this is something that, again, it would be really be interesting to, to simulate and analyze. And if anybody wants to join in, is very welcome. The only explanation that would explain really what we saw is the fact that and this is really a toy model. This would be the neutron star 
and the hot spot due to accretion, which coincide with the basically with the magnetic field before the bursts. And as the burst becomes brighter, the fuel expands again, but the expansion is more favorable at the pole, at the magnetic pole, because it can move along the field lines. While out, away from the pole, the field lines are more parallel to the surface, and so they, they make it more an obstacle to the expansion of the fuel. And so this would create basically a brighter patch at the equator and would also move the accretion shock basically backward, causing the, the fact that the phase of the brightest patch comes arrives later. And as the brightness subsides, so as the fluid subsides, all the fluid sinks back in, and so the bright patch comes back. Not exactly one-to-one -one because, um, yeah, I mean, the fuel itself will have disrupted a little bit of column and so on. But this is basically the only explanation that can fit. And so it looks like the, the burst oscillation generated by the in, in, in magnetic sources, and we tested this in, in, in the observation of other sources, and it's less uh, statistically significant, but it seems that the behavior is the same, is that they are really different. So they perhaps they are not really modes. Um, they are just more the interaction of the burst with the column. So this means that the pattern is different and it means that if you want to use these to measure the mass and radius, you have to use completely different patterns. But this, as I said, is really work in progress, so don't take it as well. Take it with really cool ground size. But I mean, there's more that we can learn from the birth, but I don't have time to talk about it. Especially we can learn a lot about nuclear reactions if we start mixing the effects of how the burning and the fuel distributes across the surface, we can start solving the discrepancy between the 1D models, predictions, and the observations. And so we can, again, go back and put limits on nuclear reaction rates and so on. But I hope I gave you at least a taste of the fact that if really we can, we reach the point where we can model the flame propagation and all the dynamics with magnetic fields or not of the flame and the fluid on the surface, we can really get a window that allow us to measure the properties and understand something about the physics of the new clusters. And I will stop here. Thank you very much, Yuri. It was a very interesting talk. So let's see if there are questions. Yes, I've been talking a little bit. Yes, so yeah. please, uh, Professor Mastiades. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, you have a very interesting talk. So, and as I was afraid, it was becoming more complicated by the minute. I'll ask something from um the early stuff do you have uh any uh, way to say about the spectral information that you get from your model and how you would fit observations i mean you saw temperatures mm -hmm. okay so can you uh predict i mean can you say something whether observational uh, spectral information can a fit or another way around or your mother that is the spectral uh, because it's a time of the same also you saw the black body at point some point but with this with the when you saw the birds that uh, I, I don't know i'm not sure i heard the last bit of the question but so uh the answer is yes um i mean Again, we haven't done it. And the, so the model, the, the simulations predict the, the temperature distributions. And so um, we, we don't really simulate the, the full extent of the, of, the, of the atmosphere and so on. So one thing that has to be taken into account is the effect of really the the photon propagation on top of the atmosphere. So 
the, the temperature distribution we have should be a little bit comport with this propagation, which could, for example, blur it a little bit because, I mean, it basically a plane parallel should work, but should not be one to one, and especially from the outer layer, you have to take into account how the the, the emission is now if it is really pointed or a more brighter beam, and then you have to uh, convolve this with the ray tracing. So, in, in, in to answer the question is yes, <laughs> but uh, I mean we haven't done it, and but but that that information would be very good because it would give us the light curves in in the various bands. And that's much stronger constraints when you start to apply it to, to observations. Okay, thank you. And another third one. Do you care about the value of b uh, well, I mean, is it of an, of an importance with the strength of the magnetic field when you have all your... Um... Yes, yes. So uh, I, I didn't have time to show it, but I have a slide. About this? Ah, what did I do? Uh, um, yeah, I don't know if you can see the screen, but yes, um, we can. So these various dots are basically the velocity of the flame you have changing the magnetic field. Okay, some magnetic fields are too too weak. But the basic the, the 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 basic point here is that up to like reasonable magnetic field of ten to the six, which are still okay for this for some of the systems, the magnetic field tension in particular is too weak. So by the time you have stretched the magnetic field so much that the, the, its tension is really kicking back, and so playing against the Coriolis force or in general, with the fluid motion, uh, the flame has already passed. And so the speed that you would measure, it's the same. And we didn't see, I mean, there were simpler simulations, so we didn't really, I'm not saying we saw, uh, I mean, there could be other instabilities that we didn't see there. But the, if the weak is too weak, is the magnetic field is too weak, it, it doesn't, it's not, uh, very effective in controlling the dynamic of the flames. It's really around 10 to the 7, 10 to the 8, and 10 to the 9 that is interacting with the Coriolis force and so on. If it becomes too strong, it starts completely dominating the, the dynamic and the, the fact that the star is spinning or not, it becomes irrelevant because it's the magnetic field tension that is really coupling the um, the layers of the fluid and it's controlling everything. And actually the field, the, the flame speed slows down because um, the, this interface becomes more vertical and so the conduction has less surface to work across and so the, the propagation is slower. And when it comes to instability, if, if you can find the fuel too much, the fuel is stable because the flame propagates just through conduction, so you're not moving fuel, you're just moving heat, basically. You're allowing the temperature to change just through the conduction. But we haven't explored all the possible configurations. And, and so the magnetic field plays. So anyway, anyway, I think these sources are about 10 to the 8, 10 to the 9 goes, if I am. Yeah, correct. exactly. So they're more on this, yeah. this regime where the, the, you should have this. Nice interplay. Yeah, thank you very yep. much. You. Are there any other questions? So, Yuri, I have a very uh, simple one uh, because I'm not an expert on that. So, the, the criterion for burning, which depends on the temperature and density, uh, mm -hmm. Is it by any means affected by the strong magnetic fields? So, because these calculations have been done without any magnetic fields, would this affect uh, the thresholds? I don't know. Yeah, so, um, I mean, it, it's a good point. Um, 
from my understanding is that, uh, I mean, the, the role of the magnetic field would be, again, affecting the conductions and that would be blocking the particles moving. So mm -hmm. you would have a stronger conduction along instead of across the magnetic mm -hmm. field. But that happens really uh, for a bit higher magnetic fields. Okay. So 10 to the 12 Gauss from there on, more or less. Mm -hmm. So perhaps in these regimes, uh, not too much. I mean, if you start winding it or through the turbulence and so on, you may increase locally, but I don't know if that's, I mean, definitely that's not in the simulations. Yes, and okay. I don't know if there's much done about it. It could affect a little bit some effects of the magnetic field conduction affected by the magnetic field. It's perhaps a little bit more relevant when you start talking about the properties of the crust. Mm -hmm. Is there the magnetic field could be higher and so on. But that's deeper down, let's say. Than, um... Okay. And have there been any, uh, 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 as far as I understood, the rising part of the light curve, uh, which depends on how fast this flame uh, uh, propagates along the surface, uh, should depend, if I understood correctly, on the spin of the neutron star, because this will affect also the strength of the of the force that confines the flaming, let's say, yeah. front. So is is there any observational support of that or not? Uh, on this, not too much. Um, one, because it's very, anyway, it's very fast. And the other is because it also depends on this mixing. Mm -hmm. And that depends less, since it's more depending on the on the strength of the uh, of the gravity. So, I mean, um, the spin determines the wind, and so that determines how unstable it is. But yes. once it, it's the instability saturates, that's really more the energy of the gravity. So, perhaps that's confusing a little bit the. Uh, the I see. The, the only thing you should see is that. The, the burst, and this I didn't have time to talk about it. It's really that without confining, confinement, so if you have a small rotation, the burst should tend to behave differently. So mm -hmm. the less confinement, if you have burst, it should be more like 1D uh, predictions. And that's actually what we see. So sources that spin slower, they behave more according to 1D predictions. Basically, mm. because your surface is more. <clears throat> so okay. there is there some, is some uh, some correlation, but not. Uh, mm. and also, there is some dependence, but basically on the yeah. spin yeah. of the neutron star. And but also not very the behavior of the stabilization of the burst when they disappear, that tends to depend also on the coordinates force, which could mm. be basically due to the fact of how much you confine the accreted fuel near the equator. Okay. So, but I didn't have time. And, yeah. I think okay. it was already longer. So. Uh, yes. Thanks for thanks for the answers. I think I understood a little bit more. So, are there any other questions? If not, I don't see any hands raised. Okay. So I will stop recording.